Many of us, Dr. Teotonio has many such milestones in his career. From medieval Goa to Goa to me to the economic history of Goa, there have been many milestones and today is yet another milestone on his book on post-colonial Goa. Uh, today we have very eminent dignitaries on the dais, the Vice-Chancellor of Goa University, Dr. Satish Sheke, uh, Mrs. Anju Timlo, the manager of the Fomentos Resorts and Hotels, Mr. Edvardo Falero, the five-time MP who represented Goa in New Delhi, and Ms. Vijaya Pace, the, uh, the representative of Wo Goa, the internet magazine. Without much ado, I go on to the first item on the agenda, and uh, that is requesting the author to present his book. First of all, thank those who are here on the table, uh, those who have been previously thought of and others who have replaced the earlier ones for the better, I would say. And I thank individually to Vijay Pace. Uh, she represents the easy publications and Vogue. So I will say a few words about, she will say the rest of it. Uh, she represents one Mr. Flavor Motero. Flavor Motero makes sense to me in the context of this publication, which is all about outgrowing, Goa outgrowing post-colonialism. And I wanted one entrepreneur, one of the new generation who could present himself or his work as a model of inspiration for the post-colonial generations. And we have that as a Catholic entrepreneur uh, who is represented by Flavor Montero. I do not know him personally, but then as we live in the globalized world of the internet, we got through in contact through internet and much of the planning that has been done so well, I didn't have to worry about anything that's being done today here. So I had to just have a good snack in the afternoon and we picked up to be brought here to be present for everything arranged. So how this could be done, I have not seen that being done in colonial times, I see that being done in the post-colonial times much better. So, in a way, I'm very optimistic about what I write. So, uh, I have introduced uh, Vijaya Pace. I don't have to introduce uh, Mr. Eduard Folero. Uh, he was here with us five years ago in this hall to release my Medieval Goa. That was the third edition of Medieval Goa and that was brought out by Frederick Moronia, who is here. Uh, but then he doesn't have this opportunity of releasing this book, but he will do the next one. Uh, thanks to Mr. Eduard Fulero. Uh, in a way, he is important, and I brought him here by all means. I wanted him to be here. He wrote the foreword to the book, and so he has, doesn't have much to speak today. <laughs> so he has been accompanying my reflections over the years because the, what has made this book are reflections that started in 2008. And so they are put together. And what helped me to reflect and put across my thoughts were my two columns. One in the Herald, which is called Historical Explorations, and the other one, since more recently, in the Goan on Saturday, both of which are connected with uh, Mr. Tim Law and his enterprise, which for me here represents the Hindu community 
in post-colonial times. So we have these two representatives. To me, they are two representatives. Could have been many others and different others, but here they are, two of them. Uh, as good businessmen, they have to be absent at the last moment, as did Mr. Flavor. So he just told me a couple of days ago that some uh, partner of his had to come from Poland unexpectedly, so he had to cancel his visit to go out to be here today. So he sent his uh, finance representative, uh, Mrs. Marie, Maria, she is there. So she has come all the way from Dubai to be present here. She sits behind, but she is the person who has been sent to represent Mr. Flavor today. And his whole team is here also. Seven or eight people who are here present besides, uh, besides Vijaya Pace. So they are all over here in the hall and they have been handling the organization uh, and helping Ms. Professor Sushila in organizing this event. Uh, Ms. Sanju, as I said, uh, is also representing Mr. Audut Timbalong, who at the last moment had to be away in Delhi. And I'm very thankful to Mrs. Anjo for having uh, replaced him and been with us. We'll have another view of post-colonial vision. And we need all possible views and visions because nothing is made of one vision. So we need them all, however conflicting they might be. And that's the dynamism of post-colonial Goa. I wish to welcome here Professor Shetie, our uh, Vice Chancellor, and I'm very thankful that despite all his other pressures of work and visits of UGC, I suppose was there, and I could not get a reply in time for some time. I was worried, but then it came, and so he is with us, and we will also want to hear uh, the Vice Chancellor on this topic, which I think. Uh, represents another view, academic vision, educational vision, which is important for us all. And then my many thanks here to Sushila, uh, because she has practically taken care of all this organization. Others have contributed, collaborated, and she is the person who did the coordination and took away much of my burden of worrying about anything at all. Now, coming to the theme of the book, uh, it's about in Konkani, what you might say, Gop. Gop, Amitana, Gopam. So this is not much Gopam, but it's uh, more serious than that. So what, we, what I'm doing here is a period which is a recent period, and I felt that after all my work of last 30, 35 years as a historian, very often we think that the historians are busy with the past politics. This is present politics. This is no politics at all. So I do not consider this book, even though it in, touches on all the themes that are politically uh, very sens sens sensitive themes, I do not consider it as a political treatment of the present. And I think what we need is to realize that the politicians have their role to play, and it's important as well. Uh, but the historians have their own role to play. And we have to do our part, whether it's considered as relevant, immediately relevant or not. It's a hard job, and it's a contribution that historians can and should make to the society, which in due time, and I think when they can do it, the politicians know to take, make use of it, and for the better, rather than see the kind of politics that we know of, how it works and how it functions. So historians have their own role to play. And uh, history viewed from the historical, cultural angle is another way of handling the present. So I might even call it history of the present, but it's the better that we are aware that there is something called history of the present. And this is to some extent what I might classify as history of the, of the present. Uh, there has been also, there is, 
around 22 chapters there. So the, some of those chapters are entirely on methodology because I think methodology for a historian defines his job and how a historian goes about it. And it was necessary that when I talk about historical treatment of the present, I tell how a historian goes about it. So at least three of the chapters are about the methodology of a historian, but not in a very theoretical way, with examples, illustrations, how things can and should be handled. But then there are other chapters which, uh, but always bypassing a concentration on 500 years of colonial rule. Because very often, Goa, when you talk of Goa, and when you even we talk of today, keeping the identity and preserving the identity, uh, very often the thoughts are identity that has been built over the last 500 years. So that looks like unique. And all the rest is lost sight of. All right. For me, one of the models has always been, and I have repeated it in many occasions on different writings, is Didi Kosambi. So when we speak of history of people, we cannot treat it as an episode or a chapter of some other national history of some other people. And so history of Goa has often been a chapter of the history of <coughs> history of Portugal. So history of Goa cannot be a chapter of the history of Portugal. So history of people is a continuous process which has started much before 500 years and has continued during the last 50 years and will continue hopefully another many centuries. So, and that's an effort of the people in the process of all these centuries to take care of the development and growth. So it's a history of continuous growth. And if it is growth, it is life. If it is life, it's full of tensions. So very often, uh, I think when we talk of special status, I've written recently some things about special status, including the last one in the Goan about the Garden of Eden politics. So, uh, but basically, uh, I'm open to many visions, and life is made of many visions. I think as many visions as people who are sitting here and others who are not here. So they are all have their vision because they all have their interests. They all have their expectations. And so that's the number of visions that we have to be prepared to see, to hear about, to listen to. And at times, they are con conflicting visions. And conflicting visions cause, cause social conflicts, turmoils. So this is what we are saying. So when we talk about, uh, here we have Prajal also fighting for a special status, and there are others, others who don't, do not write, but they have their vision as well. Uh, so I think we cannot reduce, special status seems to be reducing our life to some sort of an aquarium. So putting goals in an aquarium or in a museum, it has to go on. So I would say, let 100 flowers bloom. Let 100 visions fight together. But not to create conflicts, but to be integrated. And that would enrich us all. And that would help us all. So what we need is actually, I would also remember our Nobel Prize winner. First Asian Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore. When we talk of regional identity, very often national identity is another version of it at another level. And nationalisms are all a result of similar process at the national levels. We are fighting at the regional level, state level. State level. And Rabindranath Tagore was definitely one who was not in favor of nationalism. So, Mahatma Gandhi and he were good friends still, but then ideologically very much at loggerheads. And I would even say that 
the idea of giving Nobel Prize to Rabindranath Tagore was to some extent uh, Western politics to pull apart even more the Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore. So to see whether they could divide them even more. If we read his book, The House and the World, for instance, that's a novel in a novel form that he writes about the evils of nationalism. We even have his several <coughs> essays published as nationalism. After Nobel Prize, he was invited by various countries to speak in the various parliaments and forums uh, <coughs> to put together all those speeches. They are very anti-national speeches. So just to remind that we can be, and at the same time, he is the man who provided national anthems for India and Bangladesh. So I, in this book, in, the, in my last page, of almost the last, last paragraph, I say, yes, we can fight about our special status. We need to fight about our identity, but never to create a new domestic wars, as the world would say. Avoid having new domestic wars. We need identities, because identity is part Multiversity or biodiversity is nat nat natural. There is no nature without biodiversity. And there is no world, humanity, without mult multiversity or cultural diversity. So it's a reality. But then it's a reality, again, which I depicted in the cover of my book. So the <coughs> cover of the book, those who have seen it in the internet, others will see it now. So the cover of the book is made up of uh, in, intersected steps or stairs. So stairs going down, steps going up. That's and they are in red and green color. So they happen to be the Portuguese national colors, <coughs> past colonial history of 500 years. But the green is also to me part of the tri tricolor. So it's also the hope of the Indian nation. So that's about the colors. But going down and going up, going up, the steps is how history is experienced and viewed by each one of us. For some, history is going up. For others, history is going down. So you have the different experiences uh, which history represents to different people. And then at the intersection of these steps is the swastika. And I explain why swastika is a cultural symbol of India and several other Asian cultures. Swastika is a symbol of welfare. But welfare understood as Vasudaiva Kutambaka. Not welfare of one group, of majority or minority. It's a welfare of the world family. <coughs> So the whole world, humanity, is seen as a family. And only when the welfare of the whole world is taken care of, that's the real welfare. If the welfare is limited only to one group or the other, it will never be the welfare that swastika represents. So that's, that's, I've spoken, that's the privilege of the author. <laughs> I do not encourage the other speakers to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all very much. And over to you. Thank you, Dr. for speaking just sufficient enough to satiate the appetite for reading. Uh, the next on the agenda is uh, the talk by our Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Satish Shetty. Uh, may I take this opportunity to tell the audience that our Vice-Chancellor received his MSc Physics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, and his PhD in Physical Oceanography from University of Washington, Seattle, USA. Thereafter, he joined the National Institute of Oceanography in 1982 and after working for more than two decades, 22 years to be exact, he rose up to be its director. 
Today we have two institutions of higher learning, one the Goa University and one the NIO. And Dr. Shete has had the distinction of heading both. I now invite Dr. Shete, the Vice Chancellor, to share his views and vision on post-colonial Goa. dignitaries on the dais, <coughs> of the dais, invitees, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I congratulate Dr. Teutonio de Souza for writing a book on the evolution of Goa since 1961. The change that came to Goa since the liberation in 1961 has been dramatic. This change ought to be recorded and analyzed to draw inferences on what direction the state could take in the future. By writing this book, Dr. D'Souza, you have touched upon a topic that is dear to Goa University, <clears throat> and I sincerely hope that it will trigger research that is focused on factors that have shaped today's Goa. While inviting me to this function, Dr. D'Souza's email suggested I should speak on my vision of post-colonial Goa. Though I am not a, socialist, a sociologist nor a historian, I accepted primarily to support the idea of Goa-centric studies and to push Goa University as a platform for such studies. Of over six decades of my life, the first decade was spent in Goa under the colonial rule. The next decade marked the crucial years of growing up, both for me and for the newly independent Goa. I was away during the 70s, but was aware that Goa was changing. It is since the early 80s, during the last 30 years or so, that I have lived and worked in Goa. The thoughts that I will express here about Goa are based on these three decades as an adult, but I will draw upon my recollections from the decade under the colonial rule. Let me begin with the recent incident that brought home the fact that Goa has changed irreversibly in the last five decades. About a year ago, a well-meaning expatriate born in Madga visited me. He was born in Goa in the early 60s and left the country, uh, left Goa with his parents as a toddler. <coughs> During his not so frequent visits to Madga in the last five decades, he has seen the city change. He has seen it become more crowded, traffic more congested, city the dirtier due to mismanagement of solid waste, and so on. <clears throat> he did not mince his words while expressing his feelings about the city he obviously loves. <clears throat> he was justifiably appalled at the visible change. I accepted his criticism without responding. However, I felt I knew more about Goa. I did my primary schooling in Marathi in the 1950s in the village of Bishodi. The Marathi school, referred to as Shara, was run by a local education society. It was crowded. We had benches but no desks. Each student wrote on the slate and on the left. Our class also had maybe half a dozen students who did not sit on the benches. They sat on the floor. The floor was clean and dry and, as was a common practice in the villages then, covered with a thin layer of cow dung. These boys, 
there were no girls amongst this group, came from the Farwad of, of the village. They were the fellow students who were invisible and untouchable for the rest of the class. All this was legal, perfectly acceptable to the government, to the society that ran the school, and to the society at large. Such a situation would be absolutely unacceptable today in any school and unacceptable to the government. In fact, it would be punishable by law and justice will, would be swift. Only a few in Goa today would have had a first-hand experience of that situation. The village of Bishoni was well looked after. It was clean, as clean as a mining town can be. There was law and order. The local bodies representing the government did their job reasonably well. Of course, these bodies and the government was run by what Dr. D'Souza calls Hindu Saraswats and the Christian Brahmin Charta elites of the colonial times. In essence, less than 10% of the population of Goa participated in the political process. There was a vast majority that was simply invisible to those who held the reins of the government. Such a situation would be totally unacceptable in Goa today. <coughs> However, very few would have known firsthand the political, social, and economic exclusion of a large fraction of the Goan society then. It has been said that the troubles that one sees in the Arab world today can be linked to political and economic exclusion of a vast majority. It is said to see these countries, once known for their tolerance, creativity, invention, pluralism, education, and open markets, go through episodes of violent revolutions that demand democracy, only to either fizzle out or get exhausted. It is when one sees such events elsewhere that one can appreciate the constitutional democracy of India and thank the founding fathers that they put it in place. The country must also thank its stars that the constitutional democracy did take roots here. It came to Goa after the rest of India had tested it for a decade. It is in the very first elections that the demographic profile of Goa that the state could afford to ignore till then was ingrained in the Goan psyche forever. The reality got accepted for the first time in modern Goa. The first elected government that truly represented the people under the leadership of Bausai Bandurkar pushed the agenda that the Indian Constitution was designed for. It takes time for political, social, and economic freedoms to produce visible changes. The expatriate gentleman from Madgaon saw the visible change resulting from inclusion of a large fraction of the society in the political process. He did not like the visible changes but failed to appreciate the invisible underlying process. Now that the underlying process has been put in place, it is time to put in place changes that reverse the unpleasant changes that have engulfed us. I would like to talk about these briefly during the rest of this talk. Improvement in our standards of living, including proper garbage disposal system, reasonable traffic regulation, power supply, water supply, etc., would require putting in place at least two systems. First, a system that aims at high economic growth with the support of mature politics. Second, an education system 
that is consistent with the goal of high economic growth. I think both India and Goa are staring at a unique opportunity to achieve economic growth that has not been seen in the subcontinent for a long time. However, it will require strong political action. The last general election had a clear message that India is interested in pursuing high growth policies. This mandate needs to be translated into action. I believe that action will be taken. My optimism about Goa's economy stems from the fact that the tourism sector in the state grew at a pace of about 10% last year. It can be argued, though using back of the envelope calculations, that this would translate into creation of about 20,000 new jobs. This figure is important because the number of births in Goa is a little less than 20,000. <coughs> in essence, a growth rate of about 10% annually in the tourism sector can generate enough jobs in the state to pull its weight in the national economy as far as employment generation is concerned. By the way, India needs to generate about 1 crore jobs to take care of its enlarging labor force. I also think that there are other sectors, pharma for example, that can provide sufficient support to growth in Indian economy to achieve the growth that the people are aspiring for. Economic growth must be coupled with mature politics with respect for law and order. While we have absorbed constitutional democracy, the importance of respect for law and the necessity of institutionalizing of social and political processes is apt to be ingrained in our psyche. We better take corrective measures soon, else we will slide into the deterioration that will undo the gains. Let us hope that the Goan polity and the society at large will rise to this challenge. Let me now turn to the education sector. Thanks to the support to education provided by the state governments, starting with the first elected government of the state, Goa has done well as far as access to education is concerned. About a third of Goan eligible population takes up university education, one of the highest rates of enrollment in higher education in the country. In fact, the country's enrollment rate in higher education is roughly half of Goa's. However, there are factors that need attention. It appears that in the enthusiasm to enlarge university education, we have laid far too much emphasis on creating graduates and degree holders and not enough of them, enough about their employability. This must be corrected. We must create enough opportunity for skill development that ensures support to manufacturing and other productive sectors of the economy. We must also make education to impart skills sufficiently flexible to provide opportunity to move up the education ladder. Fortunately, such a system, system is now viable, and I'm optimistic that Goa will put in place a system that takes a holistic look at the higher education requirements of the state's youth. In summary, I do think that Goa has done rather well in the post-colonial five decades to make our political system inclusive. This is indeed an achievement that all Goans should be proud of. Challenges remain as far as our future is concerned. There is reason to be optimistic here if our polity shows the maturity that the people of the state deserve. Before concluding, I once again congratulate Dr. D'Souza for writing a book that focuses on a highly relevant issue for the state. Namely, how have we evolved in the recent past 
and how are we going to be in the recent, in the near future. I sincerely hope that the book will generate consensus in the state on the direction that we need to pursue. I thank you, sir, for inviting me to this function and giving me an opportunity to share my views. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shekhe, for placing before this audience your vision of for our small state of Goa. Thank you also for placing before us the Goan reality. You have analyzed well, and it is food for our thought. Before I go to the next speaker, may I also inform the audience that Dr. Shete has, in his tenure as Vice Chancellor, promoted a lot of out-of-the-box ideas. And his most recent addition, along with his team, is the chairs that are instituted for history, for the arts, for the voices, the songs, in the languages, and in almost every field where members of the public have an opportunity to interact with eminent personalities from all over the country. This month, we are also having Romila Thapa coming to the Goa University to interact with the public. The next speaker is uh, my model of women's empowerment, Mrs. Anju Timlo. Uh, she is the manager of the Fermentos Resorts and Hotels, but what the audience may not know is that she has been a scholar in her own right. She has stood first in the modern school New Delhi, first in an all India high secondary exam and also first in Lady Sri Ram College, one of the most reputed colleges in the country in New Delhi, where she graduated with economic honors. Repeating this hat trick was where she got a gold medal in the LLB examination in government law, Mumbai. She was invited then to be a professor of law in the Sargankar Law College. I think these type of standing first all the time show that she has been, besides being intelligent, a very hardworking woman. For the past 32 years, she has handled Fermentos along with her team. She has handled her three growing sons, and she has also found time to do things for the community. She has been the president of the All India Women's Conference, the Goa section. She has been instrumental in building a hostel for working girls in Port Vori, has organized a number of functions to promote cultural activities. Uh, we are indeed honored, madam, to have you here with us. Uh, Mrs. Timlo will be speaking on Goa's evolution as witnessed by her and the Goa native business role in it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, the dignitaries on the days, and my congratulations to Dr. Tiptonio de Souza on his book. I must thank my husband for not being here and letting me come, because it really gave me a good insight in the book that we are all going to go through this uh, today. And uh, I've had, an, uh, had time and opportunity to go through quite a few chapters. And really, it is so important to keep looking at our history and we, where we are going as people of any, any territory, any state, any country. Uh, I will talk about evolution in two, two parts because a little bit of what Audu Chiblo went through, being born in Goa and being a Goan and about me, because I have been part, I have been a part of the majority of the years of post-colonialism in Goa. I came here 41 years ago, so I have seen four decades of it. So I think I also can claim to have 
to be part of Goa and to be able to express my views are the same. Um, Aldith uh, Timlo also, like Dr. Shetty, went to a Marathi medium school when he first started his education. But he was fortunate because he was in Margaon, that the school was in definitely better condition. And he has very pleasant memories, though of course it was a boys school. There were no girls in his school. And after that, though we were, we were still <clears throat> under the Portuguese rule, he went to Bombay to study. At the time when, when he went in uh, 1960, he went to a um, Jesuit school, which is county school, and it was a completely different atmosphere. He had no knowledge of English, and his major mother tongue was Marathi and Konkani, because that is what he had heard with his school and home. And at all times, he was made to feel he was a foreigner, uh, because he did not have an Indian passport and he had a Portuguese, uh, I don't know what that was called at that time. Was it a passport or was it just some kind of, uh, some document? That, uh, yes, that's right. So every time they asked how many foreigners in the class, he would look like all of them, but he would stand with the Koreans and the Americans and uh, any other nationality in the class and raise his hand. So quite an interesting, uh, um, experience that he narrated to me. After that, of course, he went to St. Xavier's but went to America to do his engineering and came back because he felt that there was business growing which had already started of uh, mining industry and related industries even before 1961. And there was pro prosperity in Goa because of that. And I have uh, very interesting stories about how a postman would come in his own small car, park it, and then take the cycle to distribute the letters. These are certain stories I've heard of prosperity around the time. So he finished his uh, graduation and came back to work with his father because industrial mining was already growing and it had been quite well established and all those concessions, of course, were given before 1961. So his native business as it would fall in, saw quite a bit of prosperity and growth in, in Goa, not just in mining, in pharmacy, in uh, different fields, and of course later into tourism. But as we can see in post-colonialism, there has been a, a variety and varied businesses that have grown. I came in 1973 to Goa as a young girl when I just finished my graduation in law. And I will tell you that the welcome, the hospitality, the warmth I found and felt in Goa and was so welcome to be in any part of any cultural activity or anything that was happening in Goa that it made me feel as if I've really arrived in a place where I am going to live and make my life. I, as I heard later in, in Goa, I had never heard that I was Bhailiv, that I was an outsider. I didn't ever experience that, and that was a great welcome. At that time, Goa was a union territory. We talk about the special status of Goa, as we are asking now. But at that time also, my observation and opinion was that it was very special because it was a union territory. All the progress in different fields of industry that happened really originated at that time, when Goa was a union territory. It was, it, tourism started then, the direct charter flight started then, we had only one flight from Bombay to Goa, all the development in this area of tourism started then. So there was a lot of growth in business in the period from 1973 onwards. In 1986, we became a state. Goa, I personally feel, is such a small place to take the burden of a state which requires so much of its own independently. 
And hence, for a while, we can see that Goa has been struggling, though we've had many industries, but Goa has had its own issues because of becoming a larger, uh, uh, larger representation of people. When we need larger representation of people, there is also a need for people to understand issues, problems of the state and work together to develop and to grow the state. As Dr. Shetty also said in his talk, all his uh, points were very relevant, but ultimately all that can happen if we have the people's will. Everything cannot be left that on the government and the politicians to do. To a great extent, we need to also mold what they do on our behalf because they are doing it for us. How much are they doing for us? This is something we need to also understand. Hence, it is important that at any given time, as we evolve in Goa, that the people of Goa should not realize, uh, should not forget their own responsibility towards Goa and its development and its uh, happiness. Because happiness is a good quotient or, and an indicator of how a state is growing and how comfortable and good people are in the state. Goa is unique because of its history. It's very different from the rest of India and it still remains really unique. And that is something all of us need to protect. Of course, there is a lot of people who've come to live in Goa. There are people who are building homes here. There are people from Delhi, from Bombay, from uh, outside the country because they have a feeling of, or an image of Goa which they find is beautiful. And that image is also true of Goa, but the, the people of Goa have to find, make sure that we are able to keep it, preserve it, and pass it on. They are pass it on to the next generation, so they also feel the same. I found it very interesting to read in Dr. Tintonio's book about identity. I think we are all very sensitive in Goa about identity. But identity also grows and changes as time goes by. The same people who were there having the Goan identity earlier may not be the same who will be in the next 10 years or 15 years. And if you see that, it is happening to the world. There is nowhere that you find that this, the identity is not changing as, as modernization comes and as the business grows and the industry grows because people migrate. Everybody is looking for good opportunities. And hence, the identity changes because people are coming here for job opportunities if they exist, and people are coming here because it's a great place to live in. But they are also people who are going to be here over a period of time and will hence impact the identity of Goa. But there is a special identity which exists, which we must all somehow keep and protect. And it is very important for me to say here that I hear a lot of Goans, meaning people from Goa, who don't live here at all. When I meet them in different parts of the world, they are, of course, first Goans, but they have this crib a lot about Goa and they complain a lot about Goa, but I don't find them contributing or solving the problems of Goa. So it's time that Goans who don't live in Goa think that they are of Goan descent, but are Australians, they're Americans, they're Canadians. They take the opportunities, advantages of those countries. And hence, to save the people who really protect and keep the identity of Goa, is other people here in Goa. And it becomes our responsibility to see that we keep it and we also understand that it will evolve and will change. We have to just make sure it changes to the positive and to be a place as welcoming and hospitable as it has always been. Thank you and I look forward to the other speakers.
thank you, Mrs. Anju Timulo, for presenting before this audience your views, or I would say, I don't know whether others felt like me, but uh, every sentence, every word was your original one. Thank you for that. And thank you also for sharing with us your personal experiences about the business happenings in post-colonial Goa. We now go on to the next speaker, also a lady, Ms. Vijaya Pace. She has been, she is at present the features editor of Bo Goa, the magazine about Goa on the internet. She is also very creative in photography, being a travel photographer, a food photographer. She has worked as an executive in the Times of India and also the content manager of Planet Goa in the past. Uh, we look forward to hearing her vision about the youth of post-colonial Goa. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to what could potentially be a life-changing moment for each and every one of us. It is an honor to be sharing the DS along with this distinguished panel with Professor Tintonio, Mr. Eduardo Filero, Mrs. Timlo, Dr. Shete, and Dr. Sushila Mendes. As Robert Frost rightly said, however far you must go for bricks, whatever they cost, a piece or a pound, but be enough for a full-length chimney and build the chimney clear from the ground. How can Goa build its chimney clear from the ground? How can Goa build its bridges? My answer would be through the youth, the blooming buds of this fair state. The future lies in educating ourselves to find our own worth and fill the voids in this generation and build on progressively what the past generation has left us. Today I have the esteemed privilege of standing in place of the CEO of Izzy Publishing and the digital online magazine Vogoa, Mr. Flavel Montero, who unfortunately couldn't make it in time for this prestigious occasion. And I'm grateful to him for introducing me to Professor Teotonio's book, Goa Outgrowing Postcolonialism. Reading this book has brought about a sea change in my own understanding of my heritage. To quote a paragraph in Professor's book, the main concern of this book is to look at the deeper cultural satisfactions or anxieties that have permitted Goans of diverse hues and conflicting interests to come together from time to time, sharing their differences in order to safeguard what they see as their most distinct or deeper heritage, which recent history has not been able to dilute. Issues of identity and culture are central to this book. It is of prime importance for the youth to inculcate a sense of identity, a sense of culture, a sense of where and why you belong. The book reflects in the past six generations, speaking eloquently of the reasons for why we, the youth, need to begin to contribute to the future of the state, the nation, and the world at large. We are the future. So why waste this great opportunity? Goa has given one and all a place to come into this world to be somebody. Now the world is your stage. There are no magic solutions, but it is important to be open to new challenges and traverse uncharted territories, which may imply risk and uncertainty. But success has always been the result of this process. You may ask, what's the way forward? How do we forge through? Post-liberation, there has been no single foundation to build on, which may lead to not a singular vision, but many visions for the future of Goa. Many have left the fine shores of Goa in search of greener pastures, when ironically, the land we live on is the most fertile on the planet. This is the land of opportunity. How do we use this great opportunity we have been blessed with? By being together, we can find that cohesive, single future for the Goan youth. And by that, by virtue of that, the future of many generations. At the risk of sounding nepotistic, I'd like to use Mr. Flavor Montero as an example of how one can use your full